With six main entries into the franchise and the next generation of consoles looming on the horizon, Ed Boon and Midway Games were faced with two options. They could move on to the upcoming PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 and continue to wage war, or they could use the last gasp of the PlayStation 2 generation to bring some much needed finality to the series near 15 year ongoing storyline. In issue 154 of Game Informer magazine, their decision was set in stone. Mortal Kombat Armageddon would remain on the closing current generation of consoles and release on the PlayStation 2 on October 11, 2006, just one month before the launch of the PlayStation 3. Ed Boon was quoted in the aforementioned article stating, By wrapping things up, we can move on to the next generation with the slate wiped clean. But how do you wipe the slate clean out of a franchise that's been around for over 15 years with 60 plus characters, all of them with their own individual backstory? Well, it's easier than it sounds. You just fucking kill all of them. The game's opening cinematic tells the tale of what brought us here, to the end times. There have been many powerful warriors throughout the millennia. But ages of mortal combat have begun to tear the fabric of the realms. The critical point has finally been reached. This massive war is known as the Battle of Armageddon. Major players are killed left and right. Old rivalries are reignited. And, in the end, we see what awaits us at the top of the pyramid that rose from the sands. Armageddon has begun. It's fucking Blaze. We've been mentioning Blaze here and there since the history of Mortal Kombat 1 dropped a few months back. And every time I bring him up, I say, just wait and see what he'll become. Well, now's the time. Mortal Kombat is probably the only video game franchise in history that takes something that starts as a rumor and over the course of 14 years, twists and turns the possibilities until the rumor takes shape as the final boss of the game's entire universe. Where else has that ever happened? Blaze becoming, in Ed Boon's words, the top of the food chain was no accident. It's just funny that after appearing in the background of MK2 simply to add an element of mystery to the universe, and dropping hints through Deadly Alliance and Deception, that Blaze is now the ultimate embodiment of the end. What an odd and yet somehow amazing journey. At the heart of Armageddon's strengths lies the roster. Every character that has ever appeared in a Mortal Kombat game is featured, playable, and comes complete with an alternate costume. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody. Stryker is back. Kai is back. Goro, Kintaro, and Shao Kahn are all playable from the start. The Dragon King, Onaga, is here and he barely fits in the character select screen. We've even got Motaro, who, oh wait, yeah. Motaro is fucked up, unfortunately. Midway encountered major difficulties attempting to program his unique body type, and even considered leaving him off the roster but ultimately decided to keep him around, even if he was a bastardized version of his former self, with only two legs. And how did they explain where the rest of his body went? Oh, uh, you know, the Shokan put a curse on it. So, that's that. Would you have preferred they just left him out? Or are you cool with the dollar store version of Motaro? Let me know in the comments. The size of the roster is astounding, especially considering each character has an alternate costume and two fighting styles. But packing so much content into this area of the game definitely came with its negatives as well, in the shape of limitations and other key modes. Fatalities, unfortunately, were hit the hardest. Gone are the days of each and every fighter having their own set of finishing moves. Fatality. In Armageddon, we're presented with a feature called Create a Fatality, where every fighter has the same set of predetermined moves which can be strung together in the order of your choice. Midway tried really hard to push this feature as being the next in the evolution of fatalities. Create a fatality takes regular fatalities to an all-time new level. You get to design your own. You get to humiliate your opponent many more times than with a regular fatality. 
but it really ends up falling flat and has the player wishing for the old days where every finisher was unique. Ultimate fatality. We've learned over time that fighting through the arcade ladder earns us a reward in the shape of an extra chapter in our Fighter of Choices story. In Mortal Kombat 4, we were treated to 3D videos. Deadly Alliance and Deception had fantastically designed artwork unveil itself frame by frame as the narrator told the story of what was to come. Armageddon's limitations are felt here big time, as completing the arcade ladder allows us to simply watch our chosen fighter practicing technique atop the Pyramid of Argus where we just fought Blades. Sure, we get a little bit of story narration, but god damn, even one painting or drawing would have gone a long way visually. This sucks. They covered the surface of the pyramid awaiting Scorpion's command. Speaking of things that suck, we've got to touch on aerial combat. Saying it flat out sucks might be a bit harsh, but Midway really pushed this feature heading into Armageddon's release as well. The aerial combat system in Armageddon is going to really expand the, the fighting plane. I may have a different experience from other players, and you guys are more than welcome to share your stories in the comments. But aerial combat almost never made a difference when I was playing. I don't even remember it's there most of the time. And when my opponent and I are magnetized together mid-jump, I usually only land one or two shots before I realize I've completely missed my opportunity. I mentioned the Pyramid of Argus a minute ago when talking about the arcade endings, yeah, and I know what you're thinking. What the hell is the Pyramid of Argus? That's a fair question, so let's get into it. Armageddon's Conquest mode follows the story of two brand new characters, brothers named Taven and Dagon. They're the sons of the newly introduced Elder Gods, Delia and Argus. The Elder Gods foresaw a day where the realms would overflow with powerful fighters, and they created the warrior Blaze to balance the universe and wipe out those fighters when the time was right. Taven and Dagon were put into a forced slumber, and would be awakened near Armageddon with the goal of slaying Blaze and bringing peace to the realms. This is the extremely shortened and less spoilerific version of the plot, by the way, so just bear with me. The Conquest plot is fairly complicated and can be difficult to keep up with, but luckily the gameplay is great, and you'll have no trouble staying engaged. Unlike Deception's Conquest mode, which featured an open world that spanned across the realms, Armageddon's Conquest is exclusively linear. We're dropped at point A and have to fight our way to point B, level by level. Hidden secrets and chests containing unlockable content are plentiful, but it's the combat that keeps the mode enticing throughout its near 15 hour runtime. Deception only proposed combat by transporting the player into the arcade mode format, whereas Armageddon has simply mapped attacks to the face buttons like a true third person action RPG. Outstanding. Throughout the story we acquire new special attacks like the ground pound and fireball, among others, and we can find permanent power-ups that increase our health and magic bars. Conquest mode in Armageddon is awesome, and feels much more like a God of War spin-off than it does a Mortal Kombat mode, and that's not a complaint. I started up Conquest mode and played through damn near the entire story before starting to write this script. I had beaten it years ago when the game came out. My plan was to just familiarize myself and get back into the groove of things before I start writing. I didn't want to put it down. I had to force myself to turn the system off. Conquest mode is so good. Now a main staple in the franchise, the crypt returns, and this time around ditches the graveyard look in favor of a mausoleum design. The crypt's contents can be unlocked through discovery and conquest, or through traditional purchase, using the coins you've earned across your time spent in Armageddon's myriad game modes. A great way to spend your hard-earned coins is on gear and accessories in the brand new, highly requested Create a Fighter mode. For the first time, we've got full control over our own custom character. We can modify their looks, gear, moveset, and choice of weapons. And truth be told, there's a hell of a lot of variety housed in here. A quick YouTube search was all it took to get a load of what sorts of creations MK fans have been able to put together throughout the years, and a good number of them are pretty damn impressive. Side note, Creative Fighter is exclusive to Armageddon, and in 12 years has never once returned to the series. Alright Dan Dans, rev your goddamn engines because it's time we took a look at the first and only time Mortal Kombat has dipped its foot into the racing genre. 
Motor Combat is an obvious play on Mario Kart, featuring our favorite MK fighters and unique vehicles complete with their own special moves. There are 10 characters to choose from and 5 tracks to race on, which is more than enough bang for your buck, especially considering most of the people who bought this game probably didn't even know the mode existed when they made their purchase. I mean, how could they? Nobody in their right mind would assume Mortal Kombat would include a kart racer mode. For example, here's a funny story. As I was doing research for this episode and playing the game, my girlfriend looked up from her book and asked, What game is this? I answered, Mortal Kombat Armageddon. She responded, What? At this point in the history of Mortal Kombat, you all know I am a huge mark for stage fatalities. Not only does Armageddon hold on to damn near every one of Deception's death traps, but it adds a whole new handful of anarchy to the batch, creating the most volatile concoction of environmental hazards we've seen yet. We're definitely meeting and exceeding our spike pick quota. But you can't forget about the crushers and grinders either. You've also got to remember your harmful liquids. And hey, how about a fucking catapult? I mean, why not? My favorite, though, is the portal. I had always wondered what had happened out there, and now we know. That's no bueno, dog. Mortal Kombat Armageddon reviewed very well, but it's a good thing that it served as an ending to the timeline, as players and critics once again began to grow tired of a familiar formula. Deadly Alliance, Deception, and now Armageddon all ran on the same engine, and after five years, that engine began to show its age. Armageddon's Conquest mode tells the story of the end, but it doesn't quite give us a clear look at what the future of Mortal Kombat holds. It would be five years before that main storyline was picked back up, but in between, we took a step into the next generation and took a look at one of the biggest what-ifs in video game history. It was April 2008. I was online, specifically on AOL Instant Messenger, talking to my buddy Giuseppe. He just read a leak that the next Mortal Kombat game was going to be a crossover featuring the heroes of the DC Universe. I responded the way anyone would. I said, there's no way that's true. Why would they make a game like that? It doesn't make any sense. The next day, I went online again, and I watched the brand new debut trailer for the game I said would never happen. The internet wasn't sure what to make of the news. Mortal Kombat characters fighting DC superheroes? Why? The idea seemed totally out of left field to most fans, myself included. But the initial trailer left me with a feeling that wasn't shared by most. I couldn't fucking wait for this game. I'd grown up a huge fan of Mortal Kombat, obviously. And while I didn't start reading comics until I was in my early 20s, I was still a huge DC fan, having grown up with Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, and Justice League. These two franchises were colliding, and I was ready to take the plunge. Reports are coming in, and Darkseid has been defeated by Superman. Conquest mode had become a staple in the MK series across the PS2 trilogy, but much like the generational leap from PlayStation 2 to PlayStation 3, the storytelling was ready to evolve as well. Conquest was no more, and in its place, we've got a brand new story mode with two unique sides to play in whichever order we prefer. Choose your side. Mortal Kombat diehards will jump into the MK story first, which sees Shao Kahn battling Raiden. Your invasion of Earthrealm violated the rules of Mortal Kombat Shao Kahn. Khan is exhausted from battle, and in a defeated rage attempts to murder Quan Chi. Raiden intervenes and blasts him with electricity, sending him into an outworld portal. What have you done? In this very same moment, in another universe, Superman dispatches of Darkseid in a battle that has seemingly wreaked havoc on Metropolis.
Superman blasts Darkseid with heat vision just as he attempts to so escape sure. through an interdimensional boom tube. And, you guessed it. Insolent fool! You're destabilizing the boom tube! Both evil bosses being blasted into world-bending portals at the same time fucked everything up. The realms of the Mortal Kombat universe began to blend with the DC universe, and two worlds colliding is never a good thing. What sorcery is this? Interesting. Sub-Zero! Coward! First you hide behind others, now you hide behind an illusion?! Shao Kahn and Darkseid are fused into one ultimate asshole named Dark Khan. Which is a terrible fucking name. It's about as original as Poochie from The Simpsons. I bet they came up with the name the same way, too. The rest of you writers start thinking up a name for this funky dog. I don't know, something along the lines of, say, Poochie, only more proactive. Yeah! So, Poochie okay with everybody? Yeah, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, you know, it's good. Dark Khan, being two ultimate evils mixed into one being, is unstable. His rage courses throughout the fractured worlds, blinding the combatants on both sides, which is the explanation for why nobody tries to just talk this out and instead resort to violence immediately. The cutscenes and voice acting in story mode are... Are you ready for this? Really fucking good, actually, I'm happy to say. There are a few stilted performances here and there, but all in all, MK vs. DC shows a marked improvement over the games of the past. One of the main questions fans had heading into the game was, obviously, what about Superman? Shouldn't he be able to grab any of the Mortal Kombat fighters and tear them in half if he wanted to? And the answer is, well, no. Magic is one of Superman's understated weaknesses, and characters like Shang Tsung have magical abilities up the ass, so... He's weakened. Magic. They also use the rage being put out by Dark Khan as the justification for how Joker can be competitive in a fight with Batman or Sub-Zero or Scorpion. These things tend to happen when you have a Worlds Collide story. There are little liberties that need to be taken in order for everything to make sense, so it kind of comes with the territory. Side note, I completed both story modes in 2008. You receive a bronze trophy for beating each side, and then a gold trophy for completing both sides. Unless you're me. My game glitched, so the trophy for beating both sides never popped. Until, Until now. Now. now! I went back and played both modes all the way through for the sake of researching this series, and my trophy finally popped. It might be 10 years too late, but god damn it, I deserve it. Two brand new features come to the game in the shape of free fall combat and close combat. Connecting with a strong attack near certain destructible barriers will send your opponent careening through the wall and into the sky where we move in for the kill. Players can attack and defend in an attempt to reverse their fate, and once the designated damage threshold is reached, tapping R1 performs a super move. Each character has their own distinct super move which deals extra damage and looks cool as hell. Close combat is similar to a grapple move. Tapping R1 in a standing position pulls your opponent into a clinch range, where simpler yet more brutal attacks can be landed. Innovation and evolution are a key ingredient to any series traveling from one generation of consoles to another, and we can definitely see huge steps made on the graphical side of things. Each and every character looks great in action, and there's even a free roam camera in the biography section that allows us to take a close look at the entire roster. Not to be left out in the evolution department is Test Your Might, which returns with a brand new face. Several levels contain breakable walls similar to those used in freefall combat, but seeing as though we're on the ground, nobody's falling. Instead, we're getting a running start and smashing the poor bastard we're fighting through as many walls as possible by button mashing like our life depends on it. I always enjoyed this little feature, even if it gave me flashbacks of the blisters I used to get from Mortal Kombat 1's Test Your Might mini game. I remember signing onto message boards leading up to the game's release, doing my damnedest to find out every little detail about what fighters were going to make the roster. 
Fans from both sides were clamoring to have their favorites make the cut. All in all, I think Midway did a pretty damn good job. On the Mortal Kombat side of things, we've got Baraka, Jax, Kano, Katana, Liu Kang, Raiden, Scorpion, Shang Tsung, Shao Kahn, Sonya Blade, and Sub-Zero. The DC roster is comprised of Batman, Captain Marvel, or Shazam, Catwoman, Deathstroke, Darkseid, The Flash, Green Lantern, The Joker, Lex Luthor, Superman, and Wonder Woman. Ed Boon stated that certain characters were chosen simply for their recognizability, like Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Batman, and Superman, while others made the cut based on how well they played against someone on the opposite side. Raiden and Captain Marvel both have lightning-based powers, so it's awesome to see them face off. As a fan of both properties, seeing these rivalries take shape is a real treat. What wasn't a treat was being promised DLC that never saw the light of day. Quan Chi and Harley Quinn were both confirmed to be headed to the game post-release, but were scrapped due to financial troubles that we'll touch on later. Mortal Kombat's fatalities have always been the source of major controversy, and MK vs. DC would be no different. The blood, guts, decapitations, impalements, and more were always scrutinized by the media. But it was this violence that played a pivotal role in what made Mortal Kombat so special. Unfortunately, one of the main pieces of the puzzle in getting DC Comics to sign on for the project was a complete and total removal of gruesome on-screen killings. DC execs would not allow for Superman and company to be seen killing other fighters, or to be on the receiving end of a decapitation or dismemberment. This meant that, for the first and only time in history, Mortal Kombat would receive a T14 rating from the ESRB. DC heroes had finishing moves called Heroic Brutalities, where the developers made a point to show that the opponent was still alive by having them writhe in pain. Batman wins. Heroic Brutality. MK fighters and DC villains, on the other hand, were still able to perform deadly finishers. They're just not quite as brutal as the moves we've seen in the past. Fatality. The limitations and toned down violence, all in all, does suck, because it would have been amazing to see what the guys Midway would have cooked up for normally anti-murder heroes like Batman and Superman, but it never struck me as being the biggest deal. You can feel free to disagree with me in the comments, I'll be happy to reply to you, but to me it's not just the violence that makes Mortal Kombat special. I enjoy the characters and their personal stories and abilities. I enjoy seeing who's going to come back from the dead for revenge, who's going to turn heel and join a new faction. I enjoy the entire world of Mortal Kombat. Taking away the depravity of it doesn't damage how much I like the franchise, which speaks volumes to me regarding how I actually feel about these games. Side note, there were a couple of fatalities that were actually censored in the American release. Apparently Joker and Deathstroke shooting their opponents in the head is just too much for a T rating. The Joker wins. Fatality. Doing a Google search in 2018 will lead you to message boards and Reddit posts full of gamers trashing MK vs DC, stating that it doesn't belong in the same breath as other games in the series, and it was never good to begin with. The game did well with critics, garnering scores between the mid-7 and mid-8 ranges, while selling nearly 2 million copies worldwide. I'm actually quite a big fan of the game, and I've popped it into my PS3 several times over the years to get my fix. I won't tell anyone who doesn't like it that they're wrong, to each their own, but I love it. Mortal Kombat vs DC Universe would be the final game Midway ever released, as their financial woes piled up to the point of bankruptcy. The Mortal Kombat license would quickly be picked up by Warner Brothers, and a facelift to the development team would take shape in the form of NetherRealm Studios. That's going to do it for the history of Mortal Kombat Part 3, Dan Dans. Thank you for joining me for this End Times and Crossover. Before we take a look at the once again unclear future of Mortal Kombat, I am going to take you back to the past. To play the shitty games that suck ass. Well, yeah, kind of. Next time out, we're going to take a look at the myriad spin-off titles deep in Mortal Kombat's closet. I'll see you next time.
Yes. Yeah.